because that was going to have an adverse impact on our financials as a group. And my view was that as one of the group executives, I had the responsibility to contribute towards the success or profitability of Denel. And taking business away from Denel did not contribute to that objective. Now, you started just before I, we adjourned. I, I'm, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Kennedy. Um, do you happen to know by any chance what it is that Mr. Saluji says was the solution, that he thought was the solution to your concerns? Do you know what it is? I'm assuming you don't that know? the solution would be, in his view, that I had actually found common grounds with uh, the uh, CEO of uh, Denel Land Systems and my other colleagues at, at corporate office. And to me, that doesn't constitute uh, a sound solution. Yes, no, but uh, my question is whether when he says he engaged, I think, with certain people within Denel and he thought a solution had been found to your concerns, do you know what he's talking about or do you not know but you, 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 you I, speculate? I actually don't know. Yes, I am speculating. Know. Yes. Yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, are, are you surprised that any solution to concerns raised by you would have been found without involving you? No, I should actually have been confronted with alternatives. I, I believe in robust debates if there are challenges. Yes. And if I'm convinced that uh, they are putting on the table a sound solution, mm -hmm. then I would actually retract my position mm -hmm. and then accept what I think is in the interest of the business. Mm. Is there nobody who ever came to you with internal or uh, DLS uh, to say, uh, apart from what Mr. Berger wrote to you, is there anybody who came and said, we actually have found a solution, this is the solution to your concerns? No, no one ever no came one to ever me, Chair. No one ever did that. No. Okay, all right. Mr. Kennedy. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Mlumbo, you mentioned as you were finishing your evidence yesterday afternoon a position paper, and then I said to you that let's leave that till the morning because that's going to take a little time. Um, could you please turn in that bundle to page uh, 793? Yes, uh, I have found 793. Is this, the, is this the position paper that you were referring to yesterday? Yes, indeed it is. And may I ask you please to turn to page um, 795. It bears your name and title, Dennis Mlumbo, Supply Chain Executive Manager. Uh, is that your signature? Yes, it is, Chair, my signature. And are those your initials next to where the person has, has amended the date? Uh, no, it is not. It is Mr. Vessel's Mr. Vessel. initials. So it is also signed, apart from yourself, by Mr. Jan Vessels, the Group COO, and Mr. Schlontlo, the Group uh, Financial Director. That is correct. Please tell the Chair how it came about that this position paper was prepared? Uh, Mr. Vessels actually approached me based on the feedback I had given to uh, the executive team of DLS and my colleagues at the uh, corporate office. And uh, he believed that we could actually find an amicable solution to, to the problem. And we discussed the issue. To which problem? To the problem of 
awarding the business to VR Laser. Okay. May, may I just ask, I'm sorry, uh, Chair, if I might, uh, sorry for interrupting you. Was that, the, was that arising from the email that we looked at yesterday addressed to them, and Mr. Saluji and others, saying this is the problem with awarding the contract to VR Laser? Was it in response to that that Mr. Vessels came to you and said there may be an amicable solution to this issue? Yeah. Yes, it was a response to that email and others before that very email. And we, we had a, a meeting, the three of us, Mr. Mshontlo, Mr. Vessels, and myself. Uh, we looked at the merits of the decision and also spoke about the flaws in the process. And in the end, they concurred with me that yes, it was definitely in the interest of uh, uh, Dinal to give the business to LMT, which is what this position paper is actually saying. But it's also looking beyond j just that uh, opportunity that we're talking about right now. If I can take you, I'm not going to go through all the reasons for your recommendation that um that LMT be given this contract. But if I can start at page 793, you see halfway down a heading evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, just read to the chair, please, the, the first two lines. I'm sorry, what page is it? 793, oh, chair. Okay. Uh, the, the bullet, first two bullet lines. No, L just, just immediately after the word evaluation. Oh, LMT is a Denel subsidiary, 51% owned by Denel and 30% owned by Pamozi, a fully black-owned company. De Denel has management control. That also means management accountability for LMT. Now, you mentioned yesterday that one of the concerns was a group policy to try and supply in-house where you had a subsidiary or a division that could do, could do the work. Was that what informed the point here in your, in your position paper? Uh, it certainly was uh, the reasons. And uh, in fact, the mere fact that we were persuaded, as I pointed out, that I was a member of the DLS board were persuaded to acquire LMT because it was a strategic company, especially insofar as the execution of the Wolf Easter contract was concerned. So it just didn't make sense to me that uh, all of a sudden we must deviate from that position. Now, you then express it is our opinion that, and then we have the bullet points or the arrows, if I can just refer to them, either by reading out the sentence or summarizing it, you refer first in the first point to LMT did submit a financially competitive quote. You've dealt with the comparison of prices yesterday, is that right? That is correct. And then your second sure. point is that LMT has already manufactured some prototype hulls, does have a nominal experience baseline from where to work and improve, you refer to them having real operational capacity and managerial challenges at LMT as identified by L uh, DLS management. What did that relate to? Without going into detail, just at a broad level. Uh, yeah, there were, were some management issues, but they didn't all emanate from LMT. Uh, someone actually did an assessment of the uh, problems and they identified that the problems were in both DLS and uh, LMT. There were some lapses in governance which I believed we could address as Dinel with that management accountability. And we worked on that and uh, I saw some improvement because I was in constant contact with the CEO of uh, LMT, Dr. Stefan Nell. And then your next arrow says the working relationship between DLS and LMT is not, 
uh, has not been satisfactory from the DLS point of view. You refer to uncommitted management and immature operational processes. Does this relate to the same point that you dealt with a moment ago? Uh, yes, indeed. Okay. Now, on the next page, that is page 794, if I can just read out, I think it's a sentence. Uh, it is our considered position that given Donnell's strategic relationship with LMT, and despite the challenges at LMT, the intended subcontract for the supply of the hull and accessories, specialized doors and related mechanisms, should not have been placed uh, on tender, but rather directly negotiated with LMT being a 51% Donnell owned subsidiary. However, given the current status of supply chain process followed on this matter, we advise that the tender process not be withdrawn, and so, since no selection or pronouncement has yet been made, DLS simply implements our preferred way forward as suggested in this paper without further communication. So that was the recommendation, and then you refer to certain improvements further down where the arrow points uh, are set out. This this recommendation um, that you then uh, prepared, and it was signed by Mr. Vessels and Mr. Nschlontlo, when the word re recommendation appears there, who is it a recommendation to? Uh, let me just correct one thing. The author of the document was Mr. Vessels, and uh, I gave my inputs, and so did Mr. Mtlontlo. And this recommendation was actually supposed to go to the group CEO, so he could actually apply his mind and uh, see if he could persuade the CEO of uh, Dinell Land Systems to reverse his uh, decision. Do you know whether it went to Mr. Saluji for approval? Well, Mr. Vessels had committed to present, to, to present it to him. Uh, I'm not aware whether he presented it or, or not. Thank you. Um, did Mr. Saluji have any discussions with you about this pr pr proposed solution? No, we, we never actually had any discussions on this issue with Mr. Saluji. And uh, the upshot of this decision, if it had been implemented, would that have meant that VR Laser would or would not get any work for, for, this, pro for this part of the project? It effectively meant that the work was going to be given to LMT, a subsidiary of Dinao, which would have made me happy. Right. Did you believe that it was uh, resolved on this basis? Well, I assumed that because I had the support of two key executives, the group uh, COO and group FD, that uh, Mr. Saluji would actually have no choice but to accommodate uh, this uh, proposal. Now, your affidavit refers to your being shocked about what you learned thereafter. Can you tell the chair, please, what you learned and why you were shocked? Uh, I was actually shocked to learn uh, a few months later that the, the business or the contract on the platform house had actually been approved on the 16th of uh, October, which was the following month, uh, and awarded to VR Laser. That was without my knowledge. And apart from the input you had previously given in the emails and your discussions with the officials, your email to Mr. Saluji, etc., and the position paper, had there ever any, been any opportunity given to you prior to 
you learning that there was this award to give input? No. In fact, the award to VR Laser was actually kept a, a secret because it was uh, a few months later that I became aware of that. And uh, that boggles the mind because as a group, you know, a supply chain executive, uh, given the quantum of this contract, I should actually have known about it. And initially, this was above 200 million, and I would have been required to present uh, in support of Mr. Saluji the proposal to the board, because anything above 200 million rand had to be presented to the board. May I take you please to the same bundle, page 797, one of the attachments to your affidavit. Uh, what's the page number? 797. Okay, thank you. You have that? Yes, I, I do. What is this document? Uh, this is a submission. Oh, I don't know. Uh, supply chain submission for the approval of uh, the platform house. Is that the is that the uh, procurement that we've been dealing with yesterday and today? Y yes, it is, Chair. And what uh, is the uh, outcome of this uh, document? What does it record? Well, the outcome of this document is that approval was granted uh, to give the contract to VR Laser for the manufacture of 183 platform hulls. But what is actually uh, notable here is that I was deliberately left out because of my position. And uh, in, in terms of the delegation of authority, I was actually supposed to uh, be the one that approving before the group CEO could sign. Now, if we look at the signatures, page 804, there's a recommendation from DLS Exco, it has the signature of Ms. Malashlela, who's already given evidence in relation to this recommendation and how she came to sign it. It's also a recommendation from, uh, uh, is it Ms. Africa? M Mr. Uh, Africa. Sorry, Mr. Africa. Uh, yes. Mr. Tierbus, Mr. Berger, and uh, from the DCO, uh, uh, the recommendation, sorry, the COO. Uh, Mr. Vessels, as well as the group CFO, Mr. Mschlontlo. Correct? It, it is correct, uh, Chair. And then we see the signature uh, of Mr. Saluji on page 806 uh, for the approval of the recommendation. We will give evidence that he did sign this as approving it uh, as group CEO. Now, you've raised a couple of difficulties um, in relation to this process, firstly, that you were this was done behind your back, as it were. Is that a fair yeah, representation? It, 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 it is true. Because I learned uh, late after discovering that this uh, contract had been awarded to VR Laser, that there was a meeting. As you can see, all the dates, uh, the, all the dates uh, are on the same day, the 16th. Yes, including Mr. Saluji's. Yes, so there was a meeting. Uh, the reason why I wasn't invited to that meeting um, uh, baffles me. You've indicated to the chair that you should have 
confirmed compliance with the processes before such a contract could be approved? Indeed. And you had specifically said it did not comply with the processes? Yes, uh, that is correct, uh, Chair. And also you have said that the board's approval was required, but it was approved instead by Mr. Saluji. Uh, that is my understanding. I'm not aware that uh, this uh, approval was presented to the board. Yes, it was initially over uh, yes. 200 million. Mr. Kennedy, this can't be the document that Ms. Malafela uh, said was amended, it had come from her, but was amended without her knowledge. Eh? No, it's different. That one must be another one. That's correct, Chair. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, Mr. Mlambo, um, can I just put to you a point that um, Mr. Vessels uh, has indicated to us as a team where he, his version diverges from yours to an extent. What his version is... Uh, is that um, the, uh, the solution that was found was suggested by him to this dilemma. And it meant that work would be split between VR laser and LMT, and LMT would only do certain components, such as the rear door, and VR laser would do the rest. Is that, was that discussed with you? If I can just take you back to your position paper, there seems to be a reference to uh, rear door work being done, page 794. Uh, yes. If I you think... look at, if I can just take you to the place and then you can continue. 794, the second paragraph, we recommend that. DLS should implement an on-site satellite project office at LMT, the full level four subcontract package for the supply of the welded hull plus accessories, doors and mechanisms should be contracted in a single directly negotiated way with LMT, uh, etc. Please continue. Do you recall discussions of LMT doing work such as the doors and VR laser doing the rest? No, what was actually agreed was that uh, LMT, in addition to the hulls, would actually uh, be given the contract to manufacture the doors uh, as well, the rear doors. Were the do doors not part of this no, con contract? No, the doors were actually a separate contract altogether. So am I understanding you correctly that the, that the hulls that were that were uh, recommended for approval to go to VR laser, you had objected to? Yes, and that remained my position right. throughout. There was ample capacity at uh, yes. LMT, and if there were any uh, production-related issues and governance issues, yes. it was our responsibility as the executive team of DENEL uh, to address those without so, having to take the business away from the uh, LMT. So the solution that you found with Mr. Vessels, as you understood it, reflected in the uh, position paper, was that VR Laser would get no work under the hull contract. That work would go to LMT because it was an in-house company and it was good on price and capacity and so forth. Management and performance issues would be resolved. And in addition, LMT would get further work in, on top of the house, uh, such as the doors. Yes, I was actually not prepared to compromise. Uh, in instances where there was a capability and capacity within any of the group divisions or subsidiaries, there was no question uh, about going out on, on tender. And it was also quite explicit in the group uh, supply chain policy. I think that is quoted in other parts of this uh, evidence. Now, to the extent that Mr. Vessels or Mr. Saluji may 
tell the Commission that this was a solution, this was a compromise. VR Laser would get, would, would get, uh, get the main part of the work, LMT would get some other work, and that this resolved the concerns that you had raised. Do you believe that your concerns and objections were uh, answered or not, properly answered or not? No, uh, certainly not. Uh, basically, that would also mean that we would have to go back and amend the group supply chain policy to say uh, there are instances when even if we have the capability and capacity, we could actually outsource the work. And that effectively means, from a governance point of view, uh, because if you amend the policy, it has to be presented to the board, that the board would have to approve that. And it's a long process. And I saw no reason why we should even debate the issue about giving work to a group division or subsidiary. To me, it's just common sense. It must be done. Now, if I can take you, please, to your affidavit, page 711, paragraph 3.16. 711. 711, top left number. Mm -hmm. on yes, this, uh, uh, on found... this page and the following page in your paragraphs 316 and 317, you refer to what seems to be some history. Uh, background about the acquisition of LMT or the acquisition of the majority shareholding. Um, is there anything you want to add to what you have said to the chair yesterday in relation to LMT and why it was significant uh, in relation to the award of the bus this business to LMT, the Hull contract? Yeah, in, in, in my case, as a board, former board member of uh, DLS, Mr. Berger himself is the one that uh, uh, presented the proposal that uh, Dinell must seriously consider acquiring LMT. LMT has got those strategic capabilities that Dinell needs, particularly insofar as the execution of the Wolf Easter contract was concerned. He actually went on to say, without LMT, uh, Dinell would have serious uh, challenges executing the Wolf Easter contract. So that was his presentation. So he's about 10, actually horrified me. And uh, I, I thought something was actually amiss. There was something that just didn't make sense in what he, he had, uh, suddenly decided to pursue. That's Mr. Berger. That's Mr. Berger. Mm. Uh, Mr. Mlumbo, may we now turn to a section of your affidavit, paragraph four, which is headed interference by Mrs. Mrs. Berger and Tubus with the integrity of the procurement process at DLS, and you refer to a number of emails that the Commission's investigators have shown you that were exchanged between Mr. Tirbus and Mr. Ms. Malashlela and uh, Mr. Tirbus, mm. uh, dealing with why they felt that VR Laser should still get, why, why Tirbus uh, in particular and Berger felt that VR Laser should, should nonetheless be awarded the contract, you indicated that you had not see, you were not copied in on those emails at the time. Yes, that, that is true. Uh, although I was horrified by the content of some of those emails, but uh, when I thought about the ones that they had actually exchanged with me, uh, it actually made sense because it was the same line of, of reasoning. Uh, they were engaging uh, Ms. Malashela on the process whilst it was still on to establish uh, where the process was and what the prospects were of uh, VR Laser getting uh, the business. 
and also uh, one of the comments that Mr. Berger raised in one of the emails was whether the inputs from Patria, which had actually conducted an on-site assessment of the three companies, was incorporated into the evaluation process. And in fact, Ms. Malachela should have said to Mr. Berger at the time, I'm not at liberty to discuss the final details of the evaluation process because we're not supposed to be influenced by anyone and uh, the evaluators are expected to focus on what they had stipulated would be the performance criteria. And the issue of the audit report by Patria was totally irrelevant. You cannot introduce extraneous factors to the evaluation process. The minute you deviate from uh, what you had stipulated would be the evaluation criteria, that actually compromises your, um, the integrity of your evaluation process. So that should never have been discussed. And the mere fact that he also pointed out that he was going to uh, engage with other parties outside the normal channels to ensure that the price was dropped. So it was a predetermined outcome that VR Laser had to get the business. So this was actually a waste of time to get people to evaluate the inputs in the first place. And at some stage, I personally felt that I should not have even pointed out the flaws in the process because the process was so flawed that it just didn't even merit any consideration. The outcome thereof was totally unacceptable, should have been rejected on any grounds by anyone. May I ask you now please to turn to page 809? 808, in fact. 80. Uh, in, in your affidavit, as I've pointed out earlier, you deal with the history that goes back to the acquisition of LMT. Uh, so these are minutes of a special DLS board meeting. So that's the Divisions Board yes. on the 31st of March 2011. And why is this significant in your view, particularly if you have regard to paragraph 6 of the, of the uh, minute? Uh, that, this is one of the sets of minutes that confirms that uh, Mr. Berger was actually extremely supportive and very enthusiastic about Dinell acquiring LMT. So it's, it's, it's one of those uh, uh, sets of minutes that confirms my position. It's unfortunate that there are others uh, with actually more specific details that we couldn't get hold of because I had already left Dinell. I'm sorry, which part of those minutes uh, reveals Mr. Becker's support for LMT? Uh, that's part six of the Is minutes. Is it at 809? 809, that's right. Yeah. Is, is uh, what's in the... Uh, the chairman started by saying he took the document submitted for discussion as read by all. Mr. Becker gave some background with reference to previous minutes in which the LMT opportunity was discussed. At a previous special Denel board subcommittee meeting, it was already agreed that a triple BEE investor is brought on board with DLS, keeping majority 51% interest. Mr. Becker explained that the previous option agreement of 70% will change to only 51%, but the risk for DLS will substantially decrease by the inclusion of Amozi, which he 
with the financial investment of 20 million rand capital and an additional 10 million rand facility. Uh, okay, so basically what is in, the, in that column is what you say shows Mr. Berger's support for LMT, for the acquisition of LMT. And, and also selling a stake to Pamozi at yes, the time, okay. like owned uh, company. Okay. Mm. Okay. Mr. Becker. Thank you. May I draw your attention to the very last small paragraph in that column? The new investor is also buying in on the basis of the future value of the combined businesses of the three parties and for more strategic reasons than financial reasons. The proposal is that DLS and Danelle should exercise the option within one year. Now, you mentioned earlier in your evidence yesterday that there was a strategic reason that Danelle uh, felt persuaded by to acquire uh, LMT. What was your understanding of that strategic reason from a group point of view? Well, uh, one of the critical as strategic uh, uh, point that uh, we were looking at was that uh, LMT had the capability to design vehicles, which in, in our case wasn't uh, that uh, matured. Uh, so that was a plus. And uh, the other capability was that LMT could actually uh, manufacture and assemble uh, vehicles. And platform hands actually make up part of that uh, a pool of uh, products that LMT could manufacture. And was there importance attached to having that capacity brought in-house, as it were, as a, as a, wholly, as a partly owned uh, subsidiary of, uh, uh, of Danel? Uh, yes, it was actually critical to have that uh, capability for, for Dinel, uh, because we're also looking at future opportunities offshore at, at, at the time. And uh, LMT was well placed to actually help us access those opportunities. When we acquired LMT, it already had uh, contracts in the Middle East. And uh, we actually felt that uh, the Middle East was a growing uh, market for, for Dinao. And uh, that was prioritized for us. But we needed to have all the critical uh, capabilities to be able to take advantage of that market. Now, Mr. Mlumbo, may we now turn to uh, paragraph five of your affidavit? You don't need to go to it. Uh, yourself, I'm just giving it to the guide for the guidance of the chair. You deal with inquiries submitted to VR Laser Services regarding the identity of its individual shareholders, and you refer to Ms. Malashlela taking certain action in that regard, and she's given evidence uh, 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 on the inquiry she made. And then you say that you engaged in correspondence with uh, Mr. Aurora, of uh, the the managing director of VR Laser. How did that come about? How did it come about that you were aware of it and you started uh, intervening or taking action? Well, I was concerned that uh, despite the fact that each time I received any correspondence from uh, DLS, there was this reference to a 100% black-owned company, 25.1% black woman-owned company, but I didn't have any evidence. When I requested evidence, initially, what I was told was that El Gasol owned 74.9% uh, of VR Laser, and uh, Crayshaw Investments owned 25.1% uh, of uh, VR Laser. And that presupposed that 25.1% uh, was black woman owned. I wanted to know exactly who that individual black woman was. But to this day, I never got an answer. 
The only answer that I received was that Salim Issa owned the 74.9%. And my instruction to DLS uh, supply chain team was that you should desist from using um, terms that are actually misleading or that are totally unfounded. When you say a company is black owned, you must have evidence that it is indeed black owned. May I take you now please to page 822. That is a letter from VR Lasers uh, Chief Operating Officer, Mr. Uh, Gianni, and that confirms that the shareholders in VR Laser were Elgasolv and Crayshaw, and it gives the percentages, 74.9 and 25.1, that they are the shareholders. They don't have any involvement or conflict doing business with Donnell. Uh, all the shareholders and directors are private individuals who do not work for government. Uh, it didn't disclose, though, who the shareholders of those companies were, and that was your concern. Do I understand your earlier evidence right? Yes, and that's why yesterday when I was asked a question about the conflict of interest uh, that I had referred to in one of my emails, uh, DLS was actually of the view that because they had received these, uh, the two declarations, that, uh, you know, the problem had been solved. And I had said, but there is no mention of all the directors of um, VR Laser, even on the document that they had accepted, which was supposed to be a valid CIPC document, and it wasn't. Uh, they, they believed that uh, that was correct. And I said, you must actually insist on getting a CIPC document. And this doesn't actually uh, address the problem, whether they have a conflict of interest or we know their identity, whether they are black or white or foreigners. We don't know that. The key issue was also establishing the actual shareholding of, of VR Lays. The individuals behind the companies. But I subsequently received another mail, um, which is probably in my um, evidence, that uh, when I, I pushed to find out who the individual shareholders of Crayshaw were, I was told that Weston Investments actually was a 100% shareholder of Crayshaw Investments. And I mean, that doesn't answer my question as well. So there was... They kept the on NSF telling you about entities Telling me about entities when my question was quite explicit mm. that I wanted to know the individuals mm. behind that shareholding. Mm. If I may take you please to page 817. There are a number of other emails. It, it seems that you corresponded not only with Mr. Aurora, but also Mr. Van der Merwe of uh, VR Laser. Uh, but if I can take you to 817. Eight, 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 seven. Eight, eight, eight appears to be an email from Mr. Aurora apologizing. Uh, for his failure to do something, and then he confirms there's been a change in shareholding at VR Laser, and this is where he refers to Elgasolv and Crayshaw, and then he says these two entities are now the sole shareholders in VR Laser. Elgasolv, ownership vested in Salim Essa. Correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. And then it says triple BEE status, 100% South African black owned, gender male. And then he deals with the other entity that co-owned VR Laser being Crayshaw. And it says ownership, 100% shares owned by West Dawn Investments, 
Is that the company you mentioned a moment ago? Yes, that, that is the one. And then he says triple BEE status. It's a level five triple, uh, BEE contributor. West Dawn is in turn owned by other corporate entities. Was that a satisfactory response in your view? Yes, certainly not. I didn't want to know uh, the corporate uh, shareholders. I wanted individuals because triple BEE's certificates actually base their assessment on the individual uh, shareholders. You have to unpack that. You can't simply accept that uh, West, West Dawn is 100% black owned when you don't have that evidence. And it's interesting that he obviously thought it was important to mention a particular individual under Elga so Mr. Salim Esra. But for the rest, he doesn't disclose any individuals. He just gives entities, uh, uh, legal entities only. Mm. Because if, it was imp if he accepted that it was important to give uh, the identity of the individuals in regard to Elgarsol, why didn't he think it was equally important to give uh, the identity of individuals in regard to the other entities? Yeah, it's mm. preposterous. Mm. Now, at page uh, 816, you send an email back to Mr. Aurora it's on the 21st of November. You say, thanks uh, for your response. Uh, where are you now? Page 816, uh, oh. Chair. Uh, this appears to be an email from you back to Mr. Aurora thanking him for his response, and you say, I would appreciate it if you could supply the following as well. Details of the individual shareholders in Crayshaw Investments or West Dawn Investments. Details of the directors of Elgasolv and Crayshaw, copies of IDs. Latest EE status of VR laser services. Were you ever given uh, proper details to your satisfaction? No, I actually never received any response. You didn't get, get a response for this one? Yeah, I, I think it was actually putting him in a bind at the time. He realized that he couldn't disclose. There, there were some serious issues, I suspected, because uh, under normal circumstances, this type of information is readily available. And that begs the question, as to whether the verification agency that declared uh, VR laser is 100% uh, black owned actually saw the evidence. Yes. Yeah, mm. I was actually tempted to write to the accreditation body yes. to actually interrogate that. Yes. Because they have the right to exercise that oversight over the performance of these uh, accredited verification. Mm. Agencies. Mm. Yes. Yeah, when I saw this uh, email Sorry. of yours, Apologies, I Chair. suspected that you wouldn't have got an answer for it. <laughs> I'm just saying, when I read this email of Mr. Mlambo to Mr. Aurora. Somehow something told me that he was unlikely to get to have got an answer. Yes. <laughs> yes. You, you may proceed. Thank you, Chair. Now, so that was correspondence in uh, November 2014, and prior to that, uh, you've indicated you didn't get a response. Um, if I can take you now to page 820. Um, the email about halfway down the page appears to have been from you in March 2015. Mm. So this is four months after your email, more than four months after your email of the 21st of November, and you address it to Mr. Aurora, and you say this email is a follow-up on the one below, dated the 21st of November 2014. Now that's the one that we've just looked at a moment ago, correct? 
that correct? That is correct. We are in the last month of our financial year and the audit process may uncover inconsistencies in Donnell's interactions with its suppliers. You say it's imperative all mandatory documents are submitted timelessly. Failure to do so may result in any future orders being cancelled or put on hold. Trust that you will treat this, respect, this uh, request with the urgency it requires. Um, then there appears to be a response to that on the foot of the previous page, 819 dated the 31st of March, 2015, from Mr. Van Merwe. Oh, yes, that's correct. And he doesn't give you the answers that you ask for, um, but raises queries. He says, further to my previous email, may I ask the following? I note that JP already provided certain information in his uh, mail the 4th of November. Um, you, will, you, however, requ requested further details of the uh, shareholders and the directors. Who is the JP? Do you know? Uh, JP was uh, or, or Mr. Aurora. Yes, if you look on the previous page, yeah. uh, 818, that's the letter that came from Mr. Aurora and his initials are JP. So you believe that's who he's referring to? Page. page 818, the previous page to okay, this one. 818. Uh, the end yes, of the yes, letter. yes. Yeah, that, that's, that's correct. Okay, uh, so you understood Mr. Fanameva to be referring to Mr. Aurora yeah. when he says JP. So he says right. he's already provided certain information, the email of 4th of November, which we've already dealt with, but you requested further details of the shareholders and the directors. That is correct, isn't it? You asked for further details. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. And then he asks his questions. In order to provide you with the correct details, can I assume you need the following documents, details? Details of shareholders, percentage shareholding in VR, laser, details of shareholding of the shareholders in VR, and then other uh, items uh, that he sets out and relating to directors as well. And you then respond on the 2nd of April, 20. 15 in the email at the top of this page. Thanks for your response. You have indeed interpreted my request quite well. In the light of the request, it is imperative that the claimed 100% black shareholding in VR laser services be confirmed to the evidence you will submit. You confirm that you repeated your request for this and its importance. Yes, it, it is correct, Chair. Now, the evidence has been that by this stage, in March, April 2015, the contract had already long since been awarded to VR Laser in the process that you've indicated did not meet with your approval. That is correct, Chair. Uh, that was on, the, on or about the 16th of October 2014. Mm. Were you aware of that when you sent this correspondence? No, I, I wasn't. I was totally in the dark at the time. And what were you trying to achieve uh, by getting this information? Uh, were you still under the impression that no contract had been awarded, but that uh, this information was relevant to the award of the contract? Was that your approach? Well, my reference to the end of the financial year uh, has got this significance. Each division is actually evaluated on its progress towards increasing the number of uh, black-owned companies in its supplier base. So at DLS, we still had uh, a VR laser that was listed as 100%. Uh, there's other correspondence, that similar correspondence that I had sent to other companies when I was actually in doubt about the correctness of what they had stated as the black ownership. So that would actually distort the report if at all um, a DLS would claim that uh, since the beginning of the financial year, they've actually increased their black-owned suppliers by this percentage. If at all, that was not verified. So I needed to be sure that whatever company that was listed as black-owned 
was indeed black owned so that I could actually give credit where it was due. Because there was this healthy competition amongst divisions that I actually liked. Um, and then I would obviously shower those that uh, were doing well without compromising on quality, of course, in terms of increasing their black um, supplier base, especially insofar as the core business of Dinell was concerned. Because typically what you find in South Africa is that most black-owned companies are actually suppliers that are on the periphery of the business. They provide cleaning services, uh, catering. Um, my focus was on the core business of, of Dinell, and VR Laser happened to be in that pool of suppliers. Can I take you back to page 801? This is part of the document we looked at earlier that was signed by various executives, but not by you, which you indicate... 801. 801, yes. The table. Okay. That's the table. I'm just uh, guiding you. This is part of the document that you confirmed earlier was signed on the 16th of October by executives excluding yourself. You see that at page 805. We looked at that earlier. Yes, yes, yes. And That's correct. as part of this submission that was approved excluding you, they have referred correctly at page 801 to the breakdown for scoring purposes and you see just above the table, basis for comparative offer price, 25%, uh, technical 45%, BEE 30%. So 30% so of scoring would actually come from, uh, from the um, BEE perspective. That, that is correct. Uh, uh, even more than, than the price. So does... Uh, so your inquiries in relation to the BEE credentials of VR laser, how important did you regard this as uh, important for purposes of a proper evaluation of tenders before they were awarded? Uh, it was critical because one of the elements that we looked at was ownership. Thank you. And then it was also the profile of the employees. And then the skills development, how much the company was actually spending on the training and development of black employees. And then uh, procurement from black-owned companies. Those are the four critical categories or elements that we, we looked at. Thank you. I'd like to turn to uh, a different topic now and a different contract. Mr. Uh, Mlumbo, you don't need to go back to your statement at this stage. Just keep the, just move now to page 824. 824. Okay. Just for the chair, uh, chairperson's uh, guidance, uh, he deals with this uh, chair in paragraph 6 of his affidavit from page 715 and following. Okay. Now, you deal there in terms of your heading, Mr. Mlumbo, with a topic which you describe as uh, a single source agreement entered into between DLS and VR Laser Services uh, in 2015. Now, we've already dealt with the Hull contract. Yes. Uh, yesterday afternoon and this morning. Now, we, this is a different contract, is it? Yes, it is indeed. It was entered into in uh, 2015, and it related to a single source appointment of uh, VR laser, laser services by DLS. Correct? That is correct, yeah. Now... I'd like you please to look at page 824 and 825. It's a memorandum that comes from Ms. Malashlela, 
as executive manager in DOS supply chain department. And um, it was sent addressed to the Donnell supply chain executive. Am I right in understanding that that was yourself? That is correct. And did you receive this memorandum? Yes, uh, I did. I, I did. Yeah. What did you understand from this memorandum? Uh, was the purpose of it, and what were you being asked to do? I was actually being asked to approve the single source status of uh, VR laser uh, to essentially supply um, fabricated uh, parts and steel components to VR laser. And this was not just limited to, I beg your pardon, to DLS. This was not just limited to the who faced their contract. That essentially meant that if at all they had any fabrication uh, requirements or steel component requirements, they would go to uh, VR laser. Now she refers in her background section at the top of uh, the text on page 824 um, to approval being given for the deviation from the normal procurement processes, etc., to be used for the T5 demo, and group supply chain executive gave an instruction that DLS must first explore how Danel vehicle systems gear ratio, uh, that's what's been referred to elsewhere as DVS, is that right? That is correct. It's a, a sister division of uh, DLS. It's, it's a 100% uh, Danel-owned company. We acquired DVS from BAE Systems. And, and then she refers also to this relating to LMT, which, as you've indicated already, was a partly owned uh, company controlled by Donnell with a 51% shareholding. Mm. So she seems to be referring to a previous uh, decision by Group Supply Chain Executive, in other words, at head office level, to prefer uh, DVS and LMT for the supply of items on the basis that they were in-house, as it were, provided they met the uh, um, requirements for quality, price, and delivery. Is she here reflecting what you were referring to yesterday? Is she ref correctly reflecting what you understood the, the group policy to be? That is correct, Chair. Then her next paragraph says, in terms of the approved supply chain policy and DLS supply chain procedure, I can just stop, so as I understand it, at group level, where you were the group executive, you had your own processes which applied throughout the group, and, and then each division also had its own supply chain procedure, which was subject to the group overall. Uh, that is correct. The focus at group level was policy and the divisions could actually customize their processes to be aligned with the police. And she refers to, to the group policy saying, and here she's quoted it, under no circumstances shall products or services that can be procured from a group entity or division be procured from an external supplier or non donnell company unless there is approval by the group supply chain executive based on sound business reasons. So she's referring here, it seems, to the point that you made yesterday in your evidence, that where there is going to be a deviation, you must approve it. That, that is correct. Uh, this is actually a quote verbatim from the group uh, supply chain policy. Yes. And... And where we looked yesterday at the delegation of authority and there was a reference to consultation with you as the group supply chain executive or manager, as it was called there, was that subject to this special provision saying you must not only be consulted if there's to be, uh, if, if there's to be a deviation from this, you must also give your approval that it is for sound business reasons? Yeah, but precisely. Yes. Then she says in the third paragraph on page 824, having identified a need for a single source supplier for the supply of steel components and fabrications, 
In May 2015, Danel, sorry, I beg your pardon, DLS signed an MOA with VR Laser for the scope of work. This scope of work. VR Laser is a 100% black owned entity. Now, if I can just stop for a moment, uh, you've already expressed your concerns about not having been satisfied that that is the case. Yes, that is correct, right. Chair. And then she continues, in terms of the MOA, VR laser prices must be re re market related and in line with the provisions of the MOA before an order can be placed on them. And then she gets to this point, due to these contradicting pos positions, Supply chain approached DLS Exco to make a decision as to whether to honor the MOA and place the order on VR laser or to follow the supply chain policy and procure from intergroup, namely DVS or LMT for this project. Given the time frame, urgency and history, Exco has recommended that the work be done by VR laser. I hereby request permission to implement the Exco decision in this regard. Now, Ms. Malashlela has already given evidence when she told the chair that her wording here was deliberate to make it clear that she was asking for your approval of this on the instructions of Exco against her own advice. Um, be that as it may, I want your, your comment, please. Effectively, as I understand it, and you must correct me if our understanding is wrong, effectively she was recognizing that the group policy required that uh, if work can be done in-house, it must be given in-house, not to an outsider, uh, subject to price and quality, etc. And secondly, if that is to be done, it has to be done with your approval as group supply chain executive that you are satisfied that there are sound business reasons for deviating. Is uh, that correct? Yeah, that, that, that is correct. And then what she's saying is, she's saying what has actually happened has been that VR Laser, a non-group entity, has been awarded this contract already, and uh, uh, there's a contradiction between that and the policy, and Exco has said they want you to approve it. Is that my understanding correct of this mem memo? Yes, that, that is actually the gist of the uh, request for Did me to approve the deviation from policy, knowing full well that there is capability and capacity within the group, which I thought was uh, ridiculous. And we'll get to, to, to why uh, in a moment, but, but the, the main point that you had to use as a test for whether or not to give approval was whether it was for sound business reasons not to give the work in-house, but to give it to an outsider. That was the test that you had to apply. Yeah, that is correct. And if in-house we didn't have enough capacity, you could have uh, such instances. And to avoid a, a program uh, slipping and uh, with the risk of having, uh, having to pay uh, penalties, uh, sometimes it would make sense to outsource part of the work to an external company, but that must be properly motivated. And that is the reason why I noted here that if DVS and LMT could furnish reasons as to why they can't execute this work, I, I would approve um, the deviation. But that never materialized. Yes. So let, let, let I me, see the I'm time. Sorry. Uh, seems to be for the tea break, Mr. Oh, I'm okay. sorry, I didn't realize. Sorry. Yes, to... but if there is one question they want to analyze uh, before. Perhaps if I can just yeah. finish okay. this thought because mm. he's just mentioned his note. Thank you. Yes. For the record, may I then, Chair, just read in, into the record, Mr. Mlumbo, your note that you're referring to, is that the handwritten note slotting NB? That, that is correct. And Chair. is that your handwriting? It, it is my handwriting. If and I my can signature. just. If I can just read it out, DVS and LMT, those are the in-house entities, must submit proof that they cannot meet the requirements prior to the contract being awarded to VR Laser. So you're saying that you said a moment ago that this is what you meant. They have to show that they don't have the capacity. 
If they don't have the capacity, you would feel there's a good business reason to award it outside the group, but that has to be shown. Yes, I needed to be convinced that uh, yeah. they didn't have the capacity and uh, they, there was a risk that we could actually miss our delivery deadline, which is a very serious yeah. uh, thing in the defense industry. If you miss your delivery milestones, you could actually lose uh, the entire profit on that contract because of that. So you have to have sound pro program management in, in place. Okay, if I might just have one further question. Yeah. Uh, and you, you say that that, has to, that proof has to be given by the in-house companies prior to the contract being awarded. It seems from the body of Ms. Malashlela's letter in the second last paragraph on page 80, 824 that she confirms that DLS had already signed a memorandum of agreement with VR Laser uh, in May 2015, five months before they were asking you to approve it. Any comment on that? Yeah, it is also one of those dodgy uh, uh, contracts that they entered into. And uh, to my surprise, uh, at the time it was uh, Zuelake Njepe, who was the group CEO, uh, Mr. Saloji had already been suspended, and he actually overturned my decision, as you can see his signature over there, without even consulting with me. Are you referring to well, the word, to his signature, Mr. Nsepe's signature on page 825? Yes, that is correct. And, and above his signature, someone has written in the word approved, is that your handwriting? No, uh, I, I rejected this. So it was actually Mr. Nchepe himself who wrote approved. And you know his handwriting? Yes, it, it is his handwriting and yes. it's his signature. He what? was the group CEO at the time. Uh, do you, what was your understanding of what he was approving? Uh, because based on where he put, he wrote approved and put his signature, uh, one doesn't know on the face of it whether he was approving your comment that the DVS and LMT must submit proof that they cannot meet the requirements prior to the contract being awarded to VR Laser, or whether he was, approved, he was finishing his approval of what Ms. Lashlela wanted in her memo. What was your understanding of what he uh, was approving? Che, he was actually overturning my decision and approving uh, the request. Okay. Without so, even consulting with me. Yes. Okay, 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 all right. So his loyalty was outside the now. Yes. Okay, all right. So he was overriding what you had just said in that note. That's correct, sir. Yeah. Okay. All right. We Thank are you, going Chief. to take the tea break. On, on a light note, I just want to declare that I didn't communicate with Mr. Uh, Kennedy or Mr. Mlambo or my registrar, Mr. Mfega, uh, with or about the color of the ties we must wear this morning. <laughs> Uh, I, I didn't talk to anybody. Okay. I don't know about the three of you, but I didn't talk to anybody. <laughs> what a coincidence. We, we follow judicial precedent. <laughs> we are Jen. Yeah.
CEO with Mr. Uh, Odwa uh, Mshluana and yourself on the 28th of April 2016. Do you confirm that you had such a meeting? Uh, yes, Chair, that is true. And then he, he says in paragraph 2 that he confirms your discussion that a single source supplier agreement, the MOA, had been entered into with VR Laser on the 19th of May 2015. Uh, pursuant to a motivation being submitted to DCO, it was recommended for approval by both the then Group Executive Business Development, Mr. Zwalaki and Sepe. Is that the same person who later acted as Group CEO when Mr. Saluji was suspended? Yes, that is correct, uh, Chair. It was also uh, approved for, uh, sorry, recommended by the Group COO, Mr. Jan Vessels. It was then approved by the group CEO at the time, Mr. Rio Saluji. Um, and then he says it, it, that approval by Mr. Saluji is in accordance with Regulation 16A64 of National Treasury Regulations. Copy of the approval, the signed MOA, and the applicable National Treasury Regulation is attached, marked A, B, and C. Now, those annexures don't appear as attachments to your letter. But your affidavit has quoted um, the regulation. Uh, if I can just have a moment. Yes. Um, Mr. Mlumbo, I think, will you just keep the letter in front of you, but I just want to give the chair the reference. Chair, the regulation is quoted in the text of his affidavit at page 719, paragraph 6.16. And I'm just going to read out from your affidavit uh, your quotation of the regulation. If in a specific case it is impractical to invite competitive bids, the accounting officer or accounting authority may procure the required goods or services by other means, provided that the reasons for deviating from competitive bids must be recorded and approved by the accounting officer or accounting authority. Are you familiar with that regulation? Yes, it's actually an instruction note uh, from National Treasure. I am very much familiar with is it binding on Danil? Yes, all Schedule 2 and 3 companies are bound by, by that. Then to continue in your letter, uh, sorry, in Mr. Berger's letter at the foot of page 837, he says, as indicated during the meeting and in terms of the above-mentioned approval by the Group CEO, the rationale for appointing VR Laser as a sole supplier was based on inter alia the following. Its unparalleled expertise on fabrication of complex engineering systems, which includes but is not limited to turrets, outer shields, add-on armor, and vehicle hull structures. Two, it is a key supplier and strategic partner to DLS. Three, it offers the best value, having inter alia committed to invest capital and resources in its facilities in order to ensure that the capability remains intact and available to DLS for a minimum period of 10 years. Four, it is prepared to assist and has established DLS with its obligations in foreign jurisdictions such as Malaysia in transferring skills relating to its manufacturing process. Uh, the IP is referred to. And then five, it promotes a black industrialist in entrepreneurial company within the defense industry. And then he concludes by saying, it is hereby recommended that the attached submissions relating to the fire compartment module FCM and the outer shield mark D and C respectively be sourced via LR, by, via VR laser uh, in accordance with the terms and conditions of the MOA. Is the last paragraph the reference to the additional work that he was asking for approval? That is correct, Chair. And the earlier part of the letter referred to the previous award of the contract without your approval to VR laser of the single source provision. Uh, that is correct, Chair. Yeah. So he asked for your approval, and you've indicated that you refused that. Uh, yes, I 
always made sure that if I rejected something, I gave reasons in, in writing. And those are the four reasons that uh, I gave. Are those the reasons in the handwritten portion next to the word, uh, next to the letters NB? That is correct. Chair. Below the blank line that was meant for your signature to approve, you instead refused to sign that and instead set out your reasons for refusal. That, that is correct. And Chair. again, is that your signature at the bottom right yeah. after this handwriting? Yes. If I may read for the record your note, one, the evidence on how VR laser was selected is not available to support the appointment as a single source supplier. Two, the approval process of the MOA con uh, excluded supply chain and the reasons thereof have not been furnished. Three, the recommendation is given the fact that um, Donnell Executive committed the company to place orders on VR laser for uh, specified pro products for 10 years to have the same executives approve future orders. Just explain that, please. Uh, basically, what I was saying, Chair, is that I'm not going to entertain this uh, because I was not party to the memorandum of agreement. Those who entered into that agreement are the ones that must actually approve future uh, transactions, which were at any rate going to be irregular. And then paragraph four sets out your final reason for rejection. A paragraph in Treasury regulations that has been cited, I'm, I'm afraid, Chair, the photocopying has cut off a couple of letters on the right-hand side, but it seems to be that has been cited in the motivation memo. Is that the provision of the Treasury instruction note I read out earlier that you're referring to? It is correct. I can read the rest of it. Yes, thank you. The paragraph in Treasury regulations that has been cited in the motivation memo is irrelevant because it was not impractical to test the supply market. Uh, this instruction note deals uh, essentially with emergency procurement. With emergency procurement, you don't really have the luxury of getting codes. But in this particular instance, it was actually quite possible, assuming that we didn't have uh, the capability within the group. It was possible to go out and uh, find a suitable uh, supplier at a competitive uh, rate. Well, it's uh, it's the second time that it looks like somebody who is going to testify here who relied on this provision doesn't seem on the face of it to understand what impractical means. I did have another witness here in relation to the free state evidence, the then CFO of uh, the Department of Agriculture said she had relied on this provision uh, for not uh, uh, for for supporting that a certain uh, job should not be sent out to open tender. But I asked her what. Uh, understanding of impractical is and it seems here I mean when you look at Mr. Berger's reasons there seems to be nothing that shows that it was impractical to invite bids because that's what uh, this provision says you know it must be impractical to invite other bids and um, before you can invoke it so that's the point I think you make in your last reason but Mr. Berger will come here, maybe he will persuade me that actually it was impractical. <laughs> yes, okay. he will be giving evidence at a later stage, uh, yes, Chief, and he yes. will be asked to deal with that. Yes, yes. May, may I ask the witness, Chair, to just give an example of what you understand would constitute the type of emergency that makes it impractical? Well, if uh, there is a thunderstorm, it blows of uh, the roof of a, a house and uh, you actually need to protect the assets within the house. 
uh, you can actually justify going out to one uh, service provider or roofing contractor to do the work because you cannot wait uh, seven days or three weeks before you get the work done. If, if life is actually threatened or your assets are actually threatened in the process, you are justified in going to just one service provider. But the expectation is that you must keep a record of that and uh, so that when you are audited, you can prove beyond uh, any doubt that uh, indeed this was an emergency. You didn't have um, the liberty to wait for two weeks or three weeks before you could have the problem addressed. In other words, you can't rely on how good a particular service provider is to justify invoking this regulation. You can't yeah. say they are so good, they are international, they are this, they provide uh, you know, excellent service. That's not a reason to invoke this. Uh, certainly <laughs> not, otherwise that would nullify <laughs> the notion of going out on, on tender. Yes, yeah, because, because the, the very reason why we go out on tender is to actually establish who of the tenderers or bidders is the best in terms of uh, the work that is required or the service that is required and the price to, you know, to, to do the job. Yeah, because when you look at the reasons that Mr. Decker gives, he says one, it's unparalleled expertise on fabrication of complex engineering systems. That's just about how good it is in his view. Mm. Then he says it is a key supplier and, and strategic partner of DLS. That says nothing about practicality. Says it, it offers the best value. That uh, says nothing about the impracticality. And then he goes on. But uh, as I read this, it just seems to me that uh, he may have misunderstood what impracticality means in that provision. But he will come and uh, he will explain and maybe he will uh, give us a certain perspective. Mm. Yes, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, what was the outcome of this, your second, the second time that you were refusing to give your approval for a contract that had already been awarded? Uh, what then happened with that? I seem to recall it may well be in this, uh, in my evidence that uh, this was also overruled. Yes. Yes, you, you, you're right. You, you do say that. Um, I'll just get you the... Yeah, I see at 839 there is something written, Mr. Chair. Uh, overruling Mr. Mlambo rejection. I guess that is what is at 840, I assume. Sorry, did you mention 849? Uh, no, I said 839. 839, thank yeah. you. Yeah, uh, it says Mr. Yes. Chepe overruling Mr. Mlambo rejection. Yes. Then 840, I think it must be the Anesha where. Okay, no, no, I'm sorry. 840 is something else, but um, there is a note at 839. Yes, Chair, uh, may I just indicate his affidavit, the witness's affidavit, refers to this annexure as being uh, showing that Mr. Nsepe overruled. This, of course, is the same document that we looked at oh, yes. a bit earlier. Yes, um, yes. And that was at page 824-5. It's exactly the same document. Yes, uh, where, where, well, I'm looking at 841 where... Mr. Jepe wrote approved and then put yes. his signature. Yes. Okay, so that must be the overruling that is being referred to. Yes. Yeah. May, okay. may I just ask the witness to confirm that, Mr. Mlumbo, you've referred to this at 841 as being the uh, the overruling by Mr. Sepe. 841. Yes, that is Mr. Jepe. Right. Overruled. 
or overturning my decision. Right. Okay, thank you. Now we can move off this uh, contract. So we've dealt with now the second contract, which is the VLS contract awarded for a sole supply, single supplier to v, um, VR Laser. Now, is it correct that there was another process followed by DVS, Danel Vehicle Systems, to award a similar contract for their product needs to VR Laser as a single source supplier? Uh, that is correct. Now, uh, you deal with that uh, in your affidavit. Um, I can just give the chair the reference. That is it from page uh, 722, chair. Now, may I take 722. you... 722. 722, yes. Okay. May I take you now, Mr. Mlumbo, to a document that you referred to in your affidavit um, that relates to this. If I can take you, please, to 843. Page 843. 843, that's correct. Yes, uh, I've found it. Now, the first email there seems to be an email from a Mr. Johann Stein. Is that uh, correct? Yes, it is. Who was Mr. Stein? in the Donnell Group? Mr. Stein was the uh, Chief Executive Officer of DVS, Denel Vehicle System. So he was the equivalent of Mr. Stefan Berger in the other division, the, the, DLS. That is correct. Right. Yeah. Now, I'm just going to read the first few lines. All, since Sulaki's surprising instruction to me a few weeks ago to enter into an agreement with VRL, we've made good progress with Jan Vessel's help. And we've had several discussions with VRL, uh, which I understand to mean VR Laser, and DCO about this. Now, can you tell the chair, please, um, we know that DLS has had a contract uh, awarded to VR Laser for its specific requirements on a single source supplier basis for 10 years. Mm -hmm. That was despite the fact that they didn't comply with processes and didn't get your approval a number of times. That They've is, given evidence on that. That is correct, now, Chair. Can you tell the Chair, please, uh, what was being proposed in relation to DVS? Uh, Mr. Nchepe, who was at the time the group CEO, had instructed Mr. Johann Stein, the CEO of DVS, to enter into a similar um, agreement with VR Laser. And uh, this is what Mr. Stein is describing as a surprising instruction. Because DVS and LMT basically have very much similar capabilities. And that's why in some of my uh, rejection notes, I mentioned the two companies as to why they are not being contracted to do the work instead of VR laser. Do you remember whether Mr. Njepe was acting Group CEO or Group CEO at the time? Uh, at the time, if it, no, 2019, he was it was already, November 2015. He, 2015, he was acting then because Mr. Saluji was on suspended suspension. in, I think it was uh, September, 2015. September 2015. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So he, he was acting. Yeah, and he was appointed as the acting group CEO. Yes, and I think Mr. Saluji uh, left uh, sometime in 2016 or 20, early 2017, I can't remember. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, 
and where you asked for your approval from the supply chain management executive's perspective for what was being proposed? Uh, yes, Chair, I was actually approached about that, and uh, I actually rejected that, that proposal. And I seem to recall that Mr. Stain uh, had actually been told by Mr. Njepe that you are reporting to me, you cannot take instructions from Mr. Mlambo. That is what Mr. Stain told me. And uh, he said to me, what can I do? I said, do what is right for the business. I'm not afraid of anyone. He must confront me and let me know why he actually insists that you have to outsource work that you can do yourself. Because Mr. Stain actually pointed out that by outsourcing that work, that was actually going to cost him about 15% more to do that. And it just didn't make sense. And I said to him, then do what is right. Uh, I've made it very clear. It's in writing. I'm rejecting that you're not going to outsource that. But then he's the group CEO, um, and he felt that uh, he had all the right to overturn my decision, and he did just that to the detriment of the business. Was there any financial detriment? Yeah, there was. At that time, um, there was surplus capacity at DVS, which could not be utilized because uh, the group CEO, Mr. Njepe, at that time, insisted that the work be outsourced to uh, uh, VR laser. So that definitely had a, an adverse impact on the financials of the group. You refer in your affidavit to Mr. Stain discussing uh, a higher cost that would be involved with VR laser. Do you recall that? Uh, yes, I, I do recall that. What did he tell you? That it was going to increase his cost by at least 15%. By to how much? 15%. 15%. That's right. correct. And typically we don't even make that kind of profit in the defense industry. If you make 7%, it's an excellent uh, net profit on a contract. But it was quite a serious uh, financial detriment yes, or pre pre prejudice to, yes, to, to yes, the Chair. Yeah. It was very serious. Mm. That's why I, I believed that even if he actually told Mr. Nchep that he wasn't going to do it, if he got fired or disciplined, he would, uh, have he would a, still a have his integrity intact. Mm. And mm. In fact, he would later be proved right that he was acting in the interests of the group. Mm. Mm. Okay. May I just have a moment? Yeah? Right. May I just mention, Chair, uh, at page... Um, sorry, May I just have a Chair, may I just indicate um, this? Well, perhaps I should take the witness to it. Uh, can I take you in your affidavit, please, Mr. Mlumba, to page um, 722? You, you, you refer in paragraph 7.1, 722 is the page. 722, yes, I've yes. found it. 7.1 and 7.2 refers to Mr. Stain saying he'd received the instruction uh, to, 
to to put an MOA in place with that, uh, for DVS with VR laser, and uh, he expressed his reservations. And the 15% is there mentioned. And then you say in 7.3, Mr. Stain further presented me to me a submission which I was supposed to sign in support of the procurement decision to enter into an MOA with VR Laser Service. I rejected the submission and presented my reasons in my handwriting on the said document. Now, you don't refer to any uh, annexure there, and I've not found in any of the annexures to your affidavit the document you refer to uh, here. We're dealing here, of course, with the V... Um, D DVS. D sorry, DVS, not the DLS that we were referring to earlier. Do you, in fact, have that document available to you? Unfortunately, I don't have it, but I had actually requested the investigators to request that document. And the unfortunate thing is that I had already left now, and uh, I couldn't have access to the documents that I, I had received. All right, thank you. Chair, may we just undertake that, uh, that we will produce that yes. for your all your records yeah. asked to have it admitted. Yeah. Uh, we just need to check also if it's not uh, an annexure to another witness's yes. uh, affidavit. We're not <coughs> quite sure at this stage. No, that's fine. And uh, if, that is far, if that is found later, uh, he could possibly just do a supplementary affidavit and confirm mm -hmm. what he knows about it. We will do it. that. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, what then happened with this project to award a sole, sole supplier contract for DVS's requirements to VR Laser uh, that was instructed by the now Group Chief Executive, Mr. Nsepe, which you were asked to approve, which you refused to approve. What then happened? Was it ultimately awarded? I... I'm not aware that it, it was awarded, but it's highly likely that it was uh, awarded. Because just like with, with the others, they were awarded without my knowledge uh, thereof. Okay, but you don't have personal knowledge as to that? No, I, All right, I thank don't. You. Now, may I now turn, leave that contract, the DVS contract, to another contract? which is uh, related, referred to as the CHAD contract in your affidavit. Tell the Chair, please, what was this CHAD contract for? Well, D Dinell uh, entered into a contract with uh, the CHAD government uh, to supply 40 CASPA vehicles at the cost of I think around $18.2 million. Uh, what I know about the contract is that uh, Mr. Njepe is the one that uh, approved the contract, but it was later um, mentioned in one of the EXCO meetings that uh, the approval of that contract was detrimental to Dinao because it was actually below cost, and it was going to cost Dinell money. And there was also an issue of what we, we, we normally refer to as a, a technical advisor uh, that had actually been paid, uh, but there was no evidence uh, that that technical advisor had actually done any work for, for Dinell. And uh, Dinell had already been committed to deliver those 40 vehicles. And what turned out was that uh, the IP, which is something that really surprised me in the motivation, it was mentioned that the, the, intellectual IP, property. the IP for the CASPA vehicles belonged to VR Laser. Yes, I just want for the record to confirm that when you say IP, you refer Inter to intellectual, intellectual property. property. That's yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. I was told that it belonged to 
uh, via laser. And uh, for that reason, I was requested to approve giving the work once again to VR laser to manufacture the 40 Kespa vehicles. I rejected that uh, request on the grounds that I was convinced that uh, the intellectual property belonged to Dinao. And no one could actually furnish any sound reasons as to why it was now in the hands of uh, a VR laser. I requested proof that Dinell had actually followed a due process to sell the IP to, to VR laser. And in my view, uh, that would have been well documented if that had happened. And I also wanted to know what were the reasons or what was the rationale behind selling the IP when there were lots of opportunities for Dinell to supply Kespa vehicles, not just to Chad, but to other countries. And all I got was that, yes, it was, but no proof to authenticate that, yes, we had sold that. And one of the things that was said in the motivation was that uh, VR Laser had undertaken at its own cost to actually make improvements to the Kespa vehicle. And uh, it was for that reason that, uh, you know, they ended up owning the intellectual property. And my question was, how could they do that without an order from uh, Dinell? Because under normal circumstances, when you place an order on a company to improve a product, you've paid for that improvement. The IP remains yours. So I didn't understand why in this particular instance uh, the IP ended up in the hands of uh, VR Laser. So I rejected uh, that request. And uh, in the process, we learned that uh, VR Laser had been placed under business rescue. And that actually forced us to look at our own internal capability and uh, capacity. And a decision was taken that uh, we would do reverse enge engineering in this case because we did not have the latest uh, data pack. Because that, if you don't have the, the IP, you couldn't possibly have the latest data pack. So that, that was the reason. And DLS motivated that uh, another company could actually supply some of the products uh, because uh, that is the chassis in particular. Uh, the chassis uh, they had already been used successfully before according to the motivation from DLS. And uh, they submitted a letter to myself uh, from a company called Sinu Truck, which is a Chinese company. That letter confirmed that uh, the accredited representative was a company known as ENNE7. And no one else could supply that chassis except that company. And it was on the letterhead of, of Sinu Truck. And uh, on the basis of that, I actually approved the designation of ENNE7 as a single source supplier, because there was evidence in this particular case. And it later turned out that there was a Bowman's report that had investigated the whole um, saga and found that, uh, amongst other things that were wrong, that the so-called letter from Sinutrak was not authentic. It was a fake letter. And uh, I had to face 
disciplinary action for having approved that. And I went out of my way, in fact, once again after the event to, to verify the authenticity of that. I wrote to the managing director of uh, Sinutrack and uh, sent a copy of that letter to him and asked him whether it was an authentic letter and he confirmed in writing that it was indeed an authentic uh, letter. So you faced disciplinary action in regard to this one incident. What about other incidents in which other people seemed to have been involved, which appeared to have been problematic? Well, uh, I actually saw this as a ruse or as a, an excuse to get me out of the way because I was a difficult person. I wasn't towing the line. Mm. And at that time, the group CEO was Mr. Danny Ditoy. Mm. Uh, because Mr. Njepe had already left. Mm. Oh. And uh, I actually thought that it had something to do with some previous disagreement, also relating to the award of a contract to a company, an auditing company, uh, that they actually believed had to be awarded that contract. But the evaluation process didn't support that, and I rejected that. And because I was now facing disciplinary action for having approved something that was authentic, uh, I requested a copy of that report from Bowman. And to this day, I never received uh, that report each time I got excuses, there are a number of emails that I exchanged with Mr. Ditoy, and uh, I never got that until I enlisted the services of an attorney, uh, Mr. Fisher, uh, who challenged that, requested the documentation, and that never happened, and Dinell actually backtracked um, after that. So are you saying that you were told that Bowman's had conducted an investigation and had concluded that uh, the letter uh, was fake, but you never actually saw the report from Bowman's? Yep, precisely. But you yeah. say uh, you yourself had communicated with the company and sought confirmation that the letter was authentic and they had provided that confirmation. That, that is correct. Yes, yeah. and that was before you were dismissed or was it after you No, I, I was never dismissed. Oh, you were never dismissed? No. Or you, you uh, resigned? Wh wh what happened, I actually decided to uh, leave the company. Yes. Because I, I, I thought the situation was such that I could not continue. Um, working for Dinella, I applied for um, a VSP, Voluntary severage, uh, Severance Package. Yes. Um, it, it, it was actually approved, but after the mention of that Bowman's report, I was told that it was going to be suspended mm -hmm. uh, pending the outcome of a disciplinary mm -hmm. hearing. When I sat back and thought about the circumstances that led to that, it was patently clear, as we will uh, discuss that, uh, or I will present evidence later, that my refusal to approve the appointment of uh, Ensign Young actually triggered that, because I based my decision on the evaluation team's report and the scores. I interrogated that, and I was satisfied that they were objective, um, impartial, fair, and uh, they did things in accordance with the requirements of the police. Okay. Mr. Kennedy. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Mlumbo, you've, you've dealt briefly now in the last few minutes with uh, a number of topics. 
all of which are set out in some detail in your affidavit, the Chad contract, the Bowman's report, the authenticity of the letter, uh, your, um, your approach to your concern about the intellectual property not being uh, established, and then also, uh, um, and, and I, I don't propose, Chair, unless you would like me to, to go through any of that in any detail, no, because fine. I think he's covered very usefully the bill yes. outline. And Mr. Mlumbo, you confirm all your evidence in your affidavit specifically in relation to that, and also the annexures that you put up in support of that. that. That is correct, Chair. The appointment of the auditors, was that the appointment of Ernst & Young that is referred to in your affidavit? Yeah, Ensign Young was not the winning uh, bidder. Uh, the winning bidder... I, I'm sorry, yes. It was, it was uh, Copano, was it not, who was actually awarded? Yeah, uh, but Copano was actually second on the list. Uh, I don't know where the evaluation report is here. Yeah? It's one of the annex chairs. Yes. But just, just, just summarise in a sentence or two, if you would, for the Chair's assistance. What was the difficulty in relation to the appointment of the auditors? Um, the, the, the tender was actually for the appointment of uh, an internal audit company. Uh, after the evaluation, as per our process, the evaluation team presented their uh, report. I was actually quite happy with their report. Initially, they had recommended a company known as Nexia, ENT, or something. Uh, but it turned out that that company had actually not disclosed some contravention. Uh, it was guilty of of issuing uh, a triple B certificate that they were not supposed to issue, and the BE Commission was involved in that. So that was a serious uh, contravention. And on the basis of the uh, representation to myself uh, by the acting group financial uh, director and uh, also in that report, he mentioned the chair of the audit committee, Mr. Talib Sadiq, that he had actually expressed concerns that the uh, evaluation team had overlooked that. I saw the evidence, and on the basis of that evidence, I concurred with them that, yes, it was the right thing to do to disqualify that campaign, which uh, I, I did. And I said, then we have to as per policy, award the, the contract to the next best company, which was Copano. And the argument that uh, was raised after that was that they didn't know Copano, that was the acting um, group CFO, uh, supported by the group CEO, and they actually claimed that even the um, uh, head of the audit committee uh, did not uh, uh, support the idea of Copano being appointed because they didn't know it. And my argument was that you don't have to know the company. After all, the three companies are large companies, and that presupposes that they have enough resources to execute the, the contract. And if I look at the headcounts of the three companies, there is no way they would not be able to execute the contract. And I said we don't actually appoint companies on the basis of who we know in those companies. I look at the evaluation report, and on the basis of that, I approve or reject if I find that there is any anomaly in that uh, report. 
And then they raised another argument that uh, the company in question was doing work for the Auditor General. I investigated that and even spoke to a senior manager at the Auditor General's office and that senior manager confirmed that almost all the companies, audit firms that are in South Africa are doing work from for the Auditor General. And I said, that is the argument I'm not going to entertain. Uh, the award will go to Copano as per the outcome of the evaluation process. That was uh, rejected because the group CEO and the group CFO uh, were supposed to also sign uh, as approving that. They rejected that and ultimately the contract was cancelled. But one of the things that did not happen, when you cancel a contract that was advertised on the e-tender portal, the National Treasuries uh, portal, you have to uh, furnish reasons and post them on that uh, website as to why you are cancelling that uh, uh, tender. That wasn't done. But then, unfortunately, uh, during that period, that's the time when I, I left the, the company. But I subsequently learned that uh, the tender was re-advertised and uh, the outcome was in favor of Anson Young, the company they wanted to appoint. So it would be interesting um, for the evaluation process to be uh, if investigated and see whether um, a, a proper process was, was followed in our wedding. I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, the contract ended up going to Ensenia. That is what they wanted to do right at the outset. Thank you, Chair. May I just conclude these questions by asking this? Uh, you started with Donnell in 2004. Uh, that is correct, Chair. And you worked continuously there until you left in the circumstances that you've just outlined to the Chair. In 2019. In that's 2019. Right. In, in so it was, it was 15 years of service. How did you feel when you left? How did you feel about the circumstances in which you came to leave? Well, it was actually sad, because uh, I had actually invested a lot of time and energy in making sure that uh, together, obviously, with people who believed in the future of Denel, to make sure that Denel is a viable and successful organization. When I joined Denel, um, I joined one of the divisions, which was at the time the biggest division in, in the group that was known as Kentron, uh, but it was later renamed Denial uh, Dynamics. Um, I, I did quite a lot. Denial was loss-making that time. It, it was in a dire state. Uh, my key role at that time was to implement a management system to um, comply with the relevant ISO standards, ISO, ISO 9001, 14001, and 18001. And uh, I managed to get uh, Denial Dynamics, which was the biggest division at the time, to be uh, ISO 9,000 and 14,000 accredited. Uh, because one of our biggest clients at the time, which was AMSCO, did not want to do business with companies that are not ISO certified. And the next big uh, project that I handled was uh, uh, running with the development 
and implementation of the strategy that we, we dubbed Voyage to Excellence. Uh, and at that time, Mr. Vessels was actually the CEO of uh, General Dynamics. And very supportive, he, I think he did a sterling job at that time, supported me, and even got me to actually be part of the team that approved the appointment of key individuals in the group with a view to uh, driving the transformation. Because as a high-tech organization, we employed a lot of engineers and scientists at, at, at Denel. And we managed through the right interventions to get uh, a lot of black engineers into the group. And uh, in that period, the division was actually doing well. People were very motivated. And it was regarded as a, a strategic. In fact, they used the term sovereign, sovereign capability, which is above strategic um, status. Because there is no other company on the entire continent that has got the capability to develop missiles and, and UAVs. And Denial Dynamics had that. And in the Southern Hemisphere as well, uh, it was the only one that could do that. So we were very proud of what we, we had achieved. And uh, uh, the company started doing well financially. And you know, the, the group, and with the appointment of Mr. Riaz Saluji, the company did even better. I think it was during his era that Dinal did exceptionally well. And it was showered quite constantly with the label of the best governed uh, SOE. Because we had good governance, uh, we were just doing well. Our processes were, were great. And it, it was actually sad to see Denali in the state it was in, being unable to pay salaries most of the time, depending on handouts. And we were losing a lot of critical skills because the focus had been lost. We we're not uh, focusing on the things that actually make a business to harm. So it was actually sad to, for me to see that happening. But what I'm hoping to see, because I still believe Denel is a very strategic and critical business, not just for the state, but for the country. It is important to find the right people in key positions that will turn the fortunes of Denel around. I think it's still possible they can still um, get back some of those lost critical skills and just get people that will focus on the things that uh, matter in a business. Mr. Kennedy. Thank you. Those are our questions, Jim. Yes, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mulambo, for coming to assist the Commission. We appreciate it very much. Um, if we need you, we will ask you again, and I've no doubt you will come back if asked. Thank you very much. My, my pleasure. Yes. Thanks for giving me the yes. opportunity. Thank you. You are excused. Okay. Mr. Kennedy. Thank you, Chair. May we call our next witness? May yes. I just indicate the next witness is not the person who directed email correspondence to the Commission that was the subject of discussion earlier. Yes. Uh, his situation will be clarified and dealt with uh, later, okay. but we propose now to call as the next witness uh, Mr. Nkosi, who are, Mr. Pumlani Nkosi, yes. uh, who I believe is present. Okay, all right. May I ask that he then come to the witness chair and then be sworn in? Yeah, okay. They can bring him up to the witness chair.
Uh, maybe I should take a five minutes adjournment while you sort out everything. As you please, Chief. Yes. We'll adjourn. All right. Yes, Mr. Kennedy. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. I confirm that our next witness, who is now in the witness box, is uh, Mr. Pumlani Nkosi. Yeah. May he be sworn in, please. Before he's sworn in, Mr. Nkosi, where is your jacket? Where is your jacket? Oh, I, I omitted it. Hmm? I omitted it. You didn't wear a jacket? You should wear a jacket when you come to a forum like this. I think somebody is going to give you a jacket. assisted you, now you uh, may take the oath for affirmation. Please state your full names for the record. Uh, learning course. Do you have any objection to taking the prescribed oath? No. Do you consider the oath to be binding on your conscience? Yes. Do you swear that the evidence will give it the truth, the whole truth and nothing else but the truth? If so, please raise your right hand and say, so help me God. So help me God. Thank you. You may be seated, Mr. Nkosi. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Good afternoon, Mr. Nkosi. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Nkosi, is it correct that you have provided, at the request of the Commission, an affidavit um, which uh, is, should be in front of you in the bundle? Correct. Uh, Chair, for the record, the bundle that I'm referring to is Danelle Bundle 03. Yes. And it is uh, Exhibit W13. Yes, thank you. Mr. Nkosi, would you please look at the document? You'll see that there are various page numbers. Look on the top left-hand side of each page. You'll see a page numbers. Do you see that? Danelle-03-004. Do you have that? Correct, yes. Uh, for convenience, we'll just refer to the number here as being four. We won't read out the whole thing. You confirm that this is, it's referred to as a statement, but this is, in fact, your affidavit? Correct. And may I take you, please, to page... Please raise your voice, Mr. Gorsi. Uh, correct. And try and just look towards the chair, if you would, wouldn't okay. mind, even though the questions are coming from me, just so that he hears you clearly. And can I ask you, please, to turn to page 27... Yes. Is that your signature above the typed name Pumlani Nkosi? Correct. And you signed that before a commission of oaths whose details and signature appear on the following page? Correct. You confirm that this, in fact, uh, sets out your evidence in written form of an affidavit? Uh, correct. And do you, have you been through this affidavit to confirm that you are happy with the contents as being true and correct? Yes, correct. And... Um, Right. Thank you, Chair. We would ask then formally for leave to have this affidavit and its annexures admitted in, uh, as, as evidence of this commission, Donnell Bundle 03, Exhibit W13. Uh, the statement stroke affidavit of Mr. Pumlane goes starting at page 4 of this bundle is admitted as Exhibit W13. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, I propose with your leave to go through particularly the introductory parts very briefly and to lead the witness on, on issues that are uncontroversial. Yes. Um, Mr. Nkosi, you are a mechanical engineer, is that right? Correct. You ho hold degrees of Bachelor of Science as well as a, an MSc in, uh, in leadership and innovation. Correct. And then you have various uh, other uh, qualifications. You are employed where at the moment? Arm school. Arm school. And when did you start? I started in 2009. 2009? Yes. Uh, your affidavit refers to your being um, initially at Arm school as a trainee engineer in 2000 to 2002. 
And then you moved elsewhere to CSIR, is that right? Correct. And then you joined BAE Land Systems, South Correct. Africa? Correct. Is that the entity also known sometimes as BLSSA? It's uh, the current DVS, Nail Vehicle System, yes. It's the current DVS? Yes. Yes. It previously was owned by the British uh, Arms Group, BAE, but it was acquired later by... Um, uh, Danel, correct, and then it is now known as DVS Danel uh, um, Vehicle Systems. Is that correct? Correct. So you worked there for what years? Uh, from 2005 until uh, uh, 2009. And is that when you moved then over from Danel to Arms Corps? Correct. And in what capacity? Uh, I was a program manager at uh, at Arms Corps. Right. And then you were promoted to what position? Uh, to a, to a team leader. Team leader yes. for what? Uh, in program management support. And is that the position you hold currently? Yes. Now your affidavit, if you can look at page um, uh, zero, uh, as, as page six. Again, look at the top left-hand numbers. The last digit is six. Paragraph three. You set out there your roles and responsibilities. Yes. As a team leader, program management support. Yes. Now I'm going to. Just leave it on the basis that obviously the chair has the uh, affidavit before the commission and has the opportunity or has had the opportunity to, to read through all of that detail. I don't believe, Chair, with the subject to your guidance that it's necessary for us yeah. to take it through that. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, Mr. Nkosi, you deal in the body of your affidavit with a number of issues relating to uh, standards that had to be met, an RSA MIL, M-I-L, standard 37. You deal with a number of tests that are referred to uh, as TP2 and TP3 tests. Before we get into that, just explain uh, your role as an Arms Corps official in this particular job that you hold now. Um, what role, if any, do you have to play in relation to testing uh, arms, uh, items of arms or components of arms and weapons? Yes, I'm a BLAS specialist. Uh, it was then referred to as an RSA Mill Standard uh, uh, Officer. Uh, that entails uh, basically ensuring that all the vehicles that go to the, to the SANDF are, are properly tested and certified. Yes. Now, you refer in your affidavit, and again, we'll get into the detail in a moment, to a need for tests to be done for certain items relating to the hoof Aster contract? Correct. You confirm that? Correct. Right. And what were those items? Uh, basically, before the vehicle can be issued to the SNDF, according to the RSA mail standard, uh, that is uh, clearly specified. That it has to be... Yes, I'm asking, sorry to interrupt, what items are we talking about? It's, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the vehicle itself. The vehicles? Yes. These are armoured vehicles? Armoured vehicles, yes. Under the hoof Aster contract? Yes. And were these being purchased by Arms Corps from Danel? Correct. And Arms Corps would supply whom with those armoured vehicles? SANDF. SANDF? Yes. Right. And is it Arms Corps' function to test the vehicles for, for something specific? It is Arms Corps' uh, uh, function to test that before it's given to the, to the SANDF. Can, can, Nell, can, can the NEL or its divisions or entities do their own testing, or do you, are you, is, is Arms Corps ultimately responsible? Arms Corps is ultimately responsible. They are the national authority. Right. Now, again, Chair, subject to your guidance, I'm going to be very brief in, in trying to get the witness to explain yes. in very layman terms, layperson terms, yeah. some technical issues. And Mr. Nkosi, can you just please bear in mind that we are, we, we, we are on the legal side rather than the, the mechanical engineering side. So please assist us in our, you know, certainly my ignorance on, on technical aspects such as this. Um, were you in your capacity that you've described personally responsible for testing uh, these armoured vehicles in relation to the hoof Aster contract or at least ensuring that proper tests were done? Uh, I only became uh, responsible from 2011. Uh, the test happened in, 20, in 2005 as the CVS indicated that I was at, uh, at uh, CSIR at the time. Yes. 
So long before you joined, there were certain tests that were done. Correct. And you've indicated in your affidavit concerns about the adequacy or the correctness of the tests that were done. Correct. And were they specifically done on armored vehicles that were being manufactured as part of the Hoof Easter project? Correct. Okay. How many tests were done, are you aware of, in 2005? In 2005, there were three tests that were done. Three tests? Yes. Okay. And um, your affidavit refers to a Mr. Franz Bietger. Yes. Who was he or is he? Uh, Franz Bietre is, 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 the, is the previous incumbent of the pro position that I'm currently holding now. So you so replaced him? Yes, I replaced him. In so, what year? Uh, basically, I was at his understudy from 2011, basically getting all the, all the background information for, for his work because it's a, it's a critical skill and a critical work as specified by AMSCO. And hence, it, it's not a work that can be... Uh, you, need, you need time just to, to get a uh, ground until you, you get yes. acquainted with the work. Yes, I understand what understand, study means. Um, now, Mr. Bietcha, you've recorded in your affidavit has sadly passed away. Yes. Uh, did he, uh, and when, he, uh, when he left the employ of, uh, of Armscore, um, how, how did he leave the employ of Armscore? Yeah, unfortunately, he was, he was ill. Uh, I couldn't carry on anymore. I think he retired just before, before turning 65. He must have been around 62. Right. So he felt he needed to spend enough time with his family. Okay. Now, Mr. Nkosi, was he the person occupying the position you later took over at the time of the tests, the three tests that you've referred to as having been done in 2005? Correct. And did he, did he convey to you information about what tests had been done? Yes, he conveyed uh, and provided all the evidence on all the tests that were done. Did he provide you with documentation in that regard? Yes, I have documentation, I have videos, I have files and uh, pictures, basically. All right, thank you. Um, now, you refer in your affidavit to a standard that is referred to as RSA-MIL standard 37. If I can take you to page eight. Yes. Your paragraph four has a heading summary of the RSA mill standard 37 issue three. Now, am I right in understanding mill there means military? Correct. Okay. Now, can you just very, very briefly, Mr. Nkosi, I don't want you to go into considerable technical detail, but can you just explain to us in a sentence or two, what the standard is, who lays it down, what is its purpose? Okay. The standard's purpose is to ensure that uh, the vehicle that ultimately goes to, to, to service by the SANDF has been properly tested, uh, as, as, as it involves uh, uh, basically uh, those vehicles uh, are subject, uh, could be subjected to, to landmines in the area of operation. So basically, that, that standard lays down on all the processes that one has to follow until uh, the, the vehicle can be issued to the SANDF. Right. So is the, is the main object of the test to ensure that the vehicle has sufficient protection against the damage uh, that might be caused if the vehicle came into contact with an explosive device such as a landmine? Correct. Now, you refer in your affidavit to two tests. You refer to them as test piece two, or TP2, and I'm going to use the, the abbreviation, and test piece three. Yes. The TP2 and TP3. Were they, were they tests that were part of this uh, RSA mill standard 37, issue three? Yes, they are part of that. Uh, there's also a TP1, a test plate one, whereby it's, it's just the, the preliminary stage of the, of, of the whole process. Yeah. So, so, so basically they are part of that, the standard. Exactly. Do you have any issue with any test relating to these vehicles in the hoof Easter project that relate to the TP1 test? Uh, TP1 test is basically a, a, a 
chest plates that you're still sort of like trying to find out scientific uh, evidence on whether the vehicle can, can actually uh, sustain and, and, and survive any landmines or something like that. The, the critical ones are, are actually the TP2 and the TP3. TP2 and TP3. Yes. And, and is that why you've dealt with those in your affidavit rather than TP1? Correct. Okay. Now, what is the... What specifically um, does TP2 test seek to test as compared with TP3? Okay. Again, very briefly from a technical okay. point of view, what is TP2 test? The TP2 test basically is the, the critical test whereby if there are bidders uh, on a particular contract of uh, supplying armored vehicles, it's, a, it's an entry test whereby you, you're actually trying to ensure that the vehicle that you are going to accept has a has minimum uh, structural integrity to be able to, to, to be considered for, 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 the, for, for the contract. Right. Yes. So Maybe. basically the understanding is that the vehicle is not being properly developed yet uh, because it's, it's still a, uh, a bidding phase. Right. Yeah. So did the chair, I think the chair wants to ask, can it? Yes, yes, yeah. Thank you, continue. may I proceed, thank yeah. you. May I just ask uh, uh, Mr Nkosi, page 10, paragraph 4.6 until 4.9 on the following page. Does that set out in more technical terms the different elements of the TP2 test? Correct. Thank you. And have you employed the same approach in relation to the TP3 test? The details are set out in paragraph 5, page uh, 11 to 12. Correct. Just explain to us, though, in layman's terms, TP3 test, how does that compare with the TP2 test? Okay, the TP3 test, it's uh, after you've, you've, you've uh, basically have a confidence that uh, the vehicle has the, the bare minimum requirements. Uh, the TP3 test is the final test now, whereby the, the, the design has been fully developed. So it's, it's, uh, you, you, can, you can then test, but uh, having a TP2 test actually prevents an issue whereby you go to us a TP3 test and there are issues. So the TP, TP3 test is a, the final test basically the final whereby one. Uh, the manufacturing baseline has been reached. Just before you begin to manufacture, it has to pass the TP3 test. Right. So before you get to a TP3 test, you must have passed the TP2 test. Correct. Right. And once you've passed that, then you can be considered uh, further for the project, but that is subject to a TP3 test being passed. Yes, the understanding is there's still some development issues that still have to be tackled, but uh, by and large, you have, uh, you have, you have met the, the, the basic requirement. Basically. Right. Yes. Now, is it possible to supply to the end user, in this case, the South African National Defence Force, who will then allocate human beings to sit in these uh, armoured vehicles. Is it possible to supply to the SANDF an armoured vehicle which has not passed the TP2 and then the TP3 test? Uh, not according to the RSML standard. Right. And what would the consequence be if there, if there was not a proper test conducted at the TP2 stage and the TP3 stage and that these were passed fully? Uh, the consequences are quite severe. One could be, uh, can be death of the, of the, of, of the soldiers, blunt trauma, uh, injuries, uh, basically, yeah, those, those are the main thing, it, a, a loss of lives. Would, would that be because, just correct me if I'm wrong in my layman's understanding, the TP2 and the TP3 tests are there to ensure that the uh, vehicle, the armored vehicle is sufficiently compliant with requirements to try and minimize damage to vehicles and destruction or injury, sorry, destruction um, of, of vehicles or injury to humans or their deaths? Correct, uh, if I may uh, further elaborate. Basically, if you're having all those tests, you, you have uh, evidence that you've done uh, uh, basic, uh, uh, all the necessary things just to ensure uh, uh, that the soldiers are safe. For future legal ramifications, if uh, there could be loss of lives, you know that you, you could actually refer them back to all those uh, test results and test uh, data that you obtained to show that you've actually done proper engineering judgment. Yes. Um, 
Right, now, now let's get to your involvement in relation to reviewing information regarding the landmine tests. You deal with that in your affidavit from page 12, paragraph 6, correct? And so you've already testified that the two tests in question were done in 2005. Three tests. Sorry, three tests, I beg your pardon, correct? In 2005, many years before you even joined. So you weren't involved in those tests. But what was your involvement in relation to those tests? Your affidavit refers to your discussions with Mr. Bietcher, who had been involved in the tests. And were you required then, as your heading suggests, paragraph uh, six, to reviewing information relating to two tests in question? Yes, basically I had to review the information and look at the data just to, just to acquaint, acquaint myself with the work as, as it was... Uh, uh, ongoing at the time. Right. And from the information you obtained from Mr. Bietcher, presumably both what he said and what he provided in the form of the documentary evidence that you've referred to, were you able to satisfy yourself that a test had been conducted for TP2? Let's leave aside whether it was a proper test, whether, whether uh, it was passed or not. Had there been an attempt to undergo a TP2 test for the vehicles in question? Yes, basically there's, there's been uh, there, there's evidence that tests were conducted for a TP2 test. Yes. For TP2 tests? Yes. Did you say? Yes. Yes, sorry, I just didn't hear you. And what about the TP3 test? Was that done? No, it was not done. It was not done. We are at one o'clock, Mr. Kennedy. Thank you, Chair. Would Shall this be we a convenient take the time? Lunch adjournment until two. Thank you. Okay, we'll take the lunch adjournment. We'll resume at two o'clock. We are adjourned. All rise. Mr. Nkosi, thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Sorry that you were a bit embarrassed about the jacket, but uh, maybe we should have just told you. Sorry, but um, it's going very well. You're nice and to the point, which is fantastic. Excellent. So just uh, find yourself somewhere to go and maybe relax a bit for an hour. We'll start at two. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. S uh, sorry that... We are